Hello, Livingstone, and it's good to see you <laughs> virtually again. Um, uh, God is still good, and I'm just grateful that God is uh, still in control, even in the midst of everything. And I know I continue to say that, but he is still very much in control, and I'm grateful to know that God, uh, he listens and he hears our prayers. Um, there's never a time that we can experience in our life that God has abandoned us or God will abandon us. He will never do that. And so that is great news, even in the midst of chaos, to know that we're not in chaos apart or away from God. He's in the midst with us. And so I'm grateful that I pray continuously for your well-being, for your safety. I know that people are uh, anxious about our first day of reopening. We don't have an official date yet. We are working uh, We're working on that. We're, we're, we're just about done with the guidelines that we needed uh, that we're going to send out to everyone. So I'm asking for your patience just a little while. We want to make sure uh, we get it right the first time. Uh, I believe your health and safety, it, it should be at the top of our list as well as your spiritual well-being. That when you enter this facility for the first time, that you come away believing and seeing that great efforts went in to, for your protection and for your safety. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who don't really believe in uh, the coronavirus is real or it has dissipated, it's gone. Uh, I'm not one of those. I believe it is still very much alive. I do know people personally that have had this virus. And so, uh, again, I believe it is our responsibility and my responsibility to make sure that we do everything we can to ensure your safety and well-being when we open those doors. So, again, I ask for your patience. Uh, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Uh, so I don't have an actual date. I know there's been rumors of an actual date. But as soon as we get that date and we're concrete about when we're gonna open, you will be absolutely the first to know. So thank you for your patience. Uh, today, I wanna to talk about a, a subject with the title, uh, For His Glory. And it could be a strange title considering what, 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 what we're discussing, but we're discussing uh, the gift of giving and specifically to the body of Christ. Uh, God has always mandated and called us uh, to be givers, uh, to support one another. Uh, as members of the body of Christ, we're called to be loyal friends uh, who stand together in difficult times. Jesus said it is not just important, but is it an essential sign that we belong to him? Uh, have your Bibles turned with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter eight. And let me just say while while you're finding the passage, um, we don't get to take a vacation from being believers. We don't get to take a vacation from being uh, children of God. Even though the world seems to be going so many different directions, and it seems that we are divided. And well, we are a divided country. We are very much a divided country. But even in the midst of division, even in the midst of racism and hatred. Uh, we still do not get to take a vacation from being a child of God or a believer or, and understanding and following what God has called us to follow, uh, follow to. It does not mean we don't have a right to say what we're feeling. We don't have a right to protest. I believe we do have a right, but in the midst of all that we do, we must maintain who we belong to. And so again, we don't have, uh, we don't get to take a vacation from being children of God. Amen. Second uh, Corinthians chapter eight, the first, uh, four verses and Paul writes we want you to know brothers about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia for in the, for the severe test of afflictions their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in the wealth of generosity on their part uh, for they for they gave according to their means as I can testify and beyond their means of their own accord uh, begging us earnestly for the favor and taking part in the relief of the saints. Uh, uh, you figure a church, uh, you understand that, that a church that gives and, and or even individuals that give, it, it's not always about giving out of your abundance, uh, but it's giving out of the heart. The, the intent is the heart, what we're doing. Uh, we know that we should care about the poor. Charity and charity to others, no matter what they are, it matters to God. But in the epistles we are, where the apostles laid the groundwork for how the church is to be run, it is charity towards our fellow Christians that is especially 
emphasize. Paul is telling Corinthians about the gesture of great love by the Christians at Macedonia for the believers in Jerusalem. Although poor themselves, the Macedonians gave generously for the needs of other saints, considering it a privilege uh, to help in this way. Though being poor themselves, they found it, they found great joy in giving to the needs of fellow believers in Christ. Uh, Paul uses the words abundance of joy and begging with much urging in describing the Macedonians uh, to, who desire to support the church at Jerusalem. Uh, think of a time that you had, had feelings or connections of helping someone and you wanted to help somebody in the body. You wanted, you know someone personally uh, of the faith that was struggling and, and yet you found great joy in offering support or offering needs, offering money, offering food to help help them through a very difficult time, even though you yourself didn't have everything you needed. Um, back in the day, there, 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 there was this sense of love that if I had to eat, you had to eat. Uh, if we had it, you had it. Even though we had to make it stretch, uh, we did not feel right, or they did not feel right if I'm eating and you're not eating. And so they made sure that everyone in their community uh, ate even if they ate the same thing, everyone had to eat. And it's, it's, it's a reminder of the early church, the church in, in, in Acts. And it says everybody had things in common. And, 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 and they went out of their way so much so that the Bible says they began to sell their personal possessions to make sure that everyone had what they needed to survive. And, and that, that example that was given then is still an example that should be given in exercise today. Uh, a former pastor of mine used to say, the church at its birth was the church at its best. The church at its birth was the church at its best. Everybody that had a need, the body came together to ensure that the needs uh, would be met. Uh, helping one another in times of need is a special charge and duty of the families. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. <clears throat> But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially the members of, the, of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. In Christ, we are a part of God's family, bound by love and duty. It is a re direct reflection on our confession as, as believers. We, we are mandated. We are commissioned to care for one another. Uh, today in 2020, it, 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 even in the churches, it seems like we're, we're trying to make sure we have more than the next church. Or we're, we're competing with the next church. We're not in unity with churches. We're not trying to, to uh, come together to meet the needs of the community God has blessed us to serve in, but yet we're, we're those that are black, bragging about how many members we have or bragging about how much money is in our account, but no one is bragging or no one is doing the actual needs of the body. And let me just uh, correct that, not saying no one, but it, but it, it is always our duty. It is always our responsibility to make sure that we are caring for the saints in the body of Christ. Uh, we can't take a vacation from that. Second uh, Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse thirteen and fifteen. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse thirteen through fifteen, and it reads. I do not mean that others should be eased at your burden, and you burden, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should apply their need, and their abundance may supply your need, that there may be firmness. As it is written, whoever gathers much has nothing left over, and whosoever gathereth, gathereth little has no lack. Um, the believers in Macedonia, Corinthian, Corinth, as well as Jerusalem, they didn't know each other personally, but the love that God had instilled in them bridges distance, even unite them across uh, boundaries. Uh, they didn't know each other, but they heard that they had a need. It's, it's like we're here we are in Little Rock or Sun Village, depends on where you are or what you believe, but we hear that somebody over in uh, Lancaster, a church in Lancaster has a need and our church in LA has a need and we don't know them personally but word has come through that they have a need and we have the means to help support their needs that 
and then we come together and we don't we don't come together in arrogance we don't come together pointing our fingers and showing how 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 much successful we are over them but we come together because we feel their hurt we we feel their urgency and we come together and we decide that we're going to extend love towards that brother we're going to extend the very mercies and the grace and the glory of God to be able to impact the lives and the livelihood of fellow fellow believer, believers in Christ. And so uh, the church of Macedonia, they, they didn't know the church in Jerusalem, but they heard that there was a need. And again, the Bible is, is clear that they themselves had issues. They themselves didn't have all of the money, but they, they, they thought it they thought it a blessing to be able to give what little they had to support the needs of the ministry and of the people of God. Uh, taking care of, um, of needs is not only the thing to accomplish within Christians, but that we stand by one another and we share the very blessings of God. Caring for other believers results in the glory of our Heavenly Father. Caring for other believers results in glory to our Heavenly Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 reads, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It, it, it brings God's glory. It brings God's glory when we help assist fellow believers that are in need. They're in the midst of the struggle. We, we, we talk about today, the, a popular word is frontline workers. Uh, those that are in the hospitals, they're frontline workers battling this coronavirus. But the church is always on the front lines or should always be on the front lines working because we will never be, never be a time as long as we're on this side that there won't be people that are in need or people that that we can bless and that we can show the very glory of God. So can you imagine what the church in Jerusalem felt when they received this monetary gift or when they received the gift from the church of Macedonia, even though they didn't know them, but they heard that there was a need and they band together and sent the necessary things to help support them during their time of struggle. Can you imagine what they felt? Can you imagine the rejoicing as they began to rejoice and began to give God praise and brought God glory because we began to care and they showed that they were caring for one another. And that would always be our mandate. That would always be our challenge. That would always be our charge to make sure that we're not just blessing ourselves for the sake of blessing Livingstone, but Livingstone is a blessing to the community in which God has blessed us to be a part of. God planted this church over 70 years ago in this right look in this exact location, not just that we might be a blessing to one another, but that we might be a blessing to the entire community that is surrounding Livingstone Cathedral Worship First Missionary Baptist Church. So uh, that mandate, that charge, that challenge will go on until God calls us home. Providing for fellow, fellow Christians also causes thanksgiving to God, prayers of blessing for the church, and even more intense love for the body. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12 through 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12 through 15. Verse 12, for the ministry of the service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contributions for them, for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. It, again, it, it, it brings glory to God when we assist in the needs of fellow believers, especially those that are hurting. The, the, the poor is always going to be with us, but does not mean that we're not obligated to try to help make a difference. As Paul recognized, one's church's obedience to the gospel gives another great joy and encouragement. Uh, is there a situation or an opportunity in your life or where faith and love or strengthened, where your faith and love was strengthened because someone thought enough of you to help meet a need that you were struggling with at times. Most of us, if not all of us, have gone through some some hard times, and we can reflect back, and uh, you're eating tonight, but you don't know what you're going to eat tomorrow. Uh, you just paid a bill today, but you don't know what you're going to pay next week, and you, you begin to, to, to map out, I can pay this one, but I can't pay this one. And so all of, I, don't, I don't know many of us who have not experienced that, but... Did it feel, did it make you feel some kind of way that when, when all of a sudden somebody reached out and, and blessed you? 
Uh, someone said, uh, put a check in the mail. Or someone brought food over uh, and they began to bless you. And what you felt at that moment, that someone thought enough of you and that your prayers were answered because you were praying and asking God, God, I don't know where, what we're going to eat tomorrow. God, I don't know what bill I'm going to pay next week. And, and someone thought enough and heard the prayers of God and God touched somebody's heart and they responded and it glorified God. It glorified God. Uh, there are times now that when a brother or sister has lost a loved one, one of the things the churches does, and they do it all over, all over the country, is that we make sure that that family that has just suffered a, a loss is well fed. People get together and they begin to bring food. I mean, they bring food and food, more food than that family can eat. But it's a gesture of we want to be here to support you. What if that same attitude not waiting for a loved one to be lost, but knowing that a family is struggling and that we can make a difference in their life. Uh, knowing that they're struggling with food to eat, but yet we can come together just like uh, someone who's just lost a loved one, but yet we decided to do it because we know there was a need or we know that their light bill, is, their lights are about to be turned off or the gas is about to be turned off. And, and, and God says we, we have the means to do right, the means to do good, the means to bring his name glory if only we would listen and trust him. And then it becomes a matter of faith because we're looking at it like, well, if I give them this, what am I going to have? God is not going to look at you and not going to take from you and not God. Old folks said you can't be God-given no matter how hard you try. The more you give, the more he gives to you. And that is a very true statement. If you give out of love, if you give from the heart, God will bless that. And again, you can't be God-given no matter how hard you try. The Jewish Christians in Jerusalem uh, were in such a desperate need. Uh, what do you think, again, how they felt when, that, when, when the gift of the Macedonians reached them? What, would you, what do you think was going through their mind? What do you think that prayer service uh, or that shouting service was that day as they began to celebrate and thank God for the church at Macedonia and thank God for Christians and believers they didn't even know personally, but thought enough of them to make sure that their needs were met. I can assure you that a prayer, that prayer day was awesome. That prayer day was amazing as they began to celebrate. Uh, first Corinthians In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul makes it clear that the Father wants us to keep certain things in-house. Uh, and let me explain. Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. I say unto you, I say to, this, to your shame, uh, can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle disputes between brothers, but brothers go, brother goes to law against another brother, and that before unbelievers? Uh, Paul is stressing the importance of keeping, keeping things in the body in-house. Uh, whether we're fighting or quarreling, uh, we don't need to go to an outside non-believing arbitrator to, to rectify or to, to handle our needs. Or we don't need, or where there's, where there's an issue in the house that we know that there's a family that is struggling, uh, we don't need to send them to the government. For the, but, but God says, and Paul says, we need to be able to do that internally to show the very support and the love of God through our, through our efforts that that family or whatever family that you have blessed would know that God and in, God intended to bless them as a family. Uh, Livingstone, we are responsible for everyone. I'm responsible for you. You're responsible for me. Um, if I have a need, you have a need. If you have a need, I have a need. And we are to work together to ensure that those needs are met to the very best of our ability. Uh, the Corinthian church had just promised a monetary gift to the Macedonians. And Paul is here writing a letter to ensure that they follow through. Jesus himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, look at Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Acts chapter 20, verse 35, and it reads, In all things I have shown you that by, the working, by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, the Apostle John told the early church that standing by fellow believers or fellow Christians and their material needs is proof that the love of God is in our hearts. Look at 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet chooses, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or, or talk in deed, but in truth. If anyone sees 
a brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? In other words, if you have knowledge of someone who's struggling and you have the means to make a difference and yet you do not, Paul says, how does the love of God abide in you? How can you say that God's love is in you and yet you're ignoring your brother or your sister's need? You have knowledge of a need and yet you ignore it. Um, the church today is often concerned uh, about caring for the poor. No wonder since uh, the experience, since to experience the new life in Christ, as in Romans chapter 5, verse 5 indicates, to be flooded with love. The Spirit of God gives us gives our hearts gives our hearts compassion, and His blessing usually increase our ability to help others by reaching out in love and to help meet the needs of others in a way, in a great way that the church reflects the character of God as well as to share the gospel. Um, Romans five and five says, and and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us given to to us. Uh, it is through the power of the Holy Spirit and it's through the compassion and the gift of God that we're able to meet the needs of God's people. It brings God great glory. It's just like a parent who watches their children do something that they have been teaching and they finally get it right. You, 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 are, you celebrate them. You, your pride is with them. And so it is the same thing when we meet, help meet the needs of other believers. When we, when we go out of our way to ensure that if I have, they have. It brings glory to God. It brings glory to God. The word of God suggests uh, it is a privilege to provide for the needs of fellow believers. Our Heavenly Father delights in his children, and it's just like other parents. He delights when his children uh, perform the duties in which he's called to do. Second Corinthians 8, 3 to 4 again says, For they are given according to they have given according to their means, and as I can testify beyond their means, of their own accord, begging earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Uh, there was an abundance of joy expressed by the Macedonians about giving to the church in Jerusalem. They found joy. They celebrated. They gave God praise. They shouted over the opportunity to, to participate in the giving to the church at Jerusalem. Again, they didn't know them personally, but they heard that there was a need and they went and they met that need. Livingstone, it, it, it's a very difficult time that that we're all living in. Uh, people are struggling with the coronavirus caused many people to be out of work. Many people were laid off. A lot of those jobs will never reopen up. And so there are many people, there are hundreds of thousands of people that are applying for unemployment and unemployment is running out. And yet some of those people belong to our church. Some of those people belong to other churches. Whose responsibility is it to help meet the needs of that family? People that you know that are going through a hard and difficult time? Are we to point them towards the government? Are we to tell them to, to get in line like everybody else and just keep praying? But are we to help meet the needs as God has blessed us to do so? If we continue to give and we continue to bless, do you believe honestly that God would allow our resources to, to disappear? Do you believe, if, if we believe that, if we carry that thought in mind, then, we, then we're carrying on the thought that all the money that we have in our bank is money that we worked hard for ourselves. We put it there, not God. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from God. If the money is in the bank and we believe that God has prospered us, God gave that to us not to hold, but God gave it to us to make a difference. How does the church grow? How does the church grow physically? How does the church grow financially? It grows by being obedient to God's word. It is in obedience that God begins to prosper us. If I take what God has given me and I hold it tight and I, I get all I get and I, and I make sure that I keep it in my own bank account, what good does that do for me? What good does that do for the body of Christ? How do I say that I'm a child of God but yet I don't contribute to the needs of the children of God? Uh, 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 again, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches at Macedonia. It was a glory. It, it brought glory to God. It brought glory to God. And I want to close with a few scriptures and, and, and uh, reminders of our responsibility and of our calling. Um, it should hurt us if we know personally of a church or people of faith that are struggling and we can make a difference and we refused to do so. We tell them that we have food bank every second and fourth Wednesdays of every month. We tell them to make sure they show up at that time. Uh, we tell them that there's handouts at other churches, but we don't 
reach out. And I'm not saying living stone. I'm saying we as a body, the body of Christ, the universal body of Christ, we don't reach out to make a difference when it was in our means to make a difference. In one passage, uh, we all know very well from uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 35. Matthew 25, verse 35. Beginning at verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous would answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when he, when he did this and, and when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you have done it unto the least of my brothers, you did it unto me. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27 and 28. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27 and 28. Do not withhold good from those whom it is due, when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again, for tomorrow I will give it, when you have it with you. Again. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. And then James chapter 2, uh, verse 14 through 17. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily foods, and, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm, and be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And then the last one, uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 1 through 4. Luke chapter 21. Verses 1 through 4. Jesus looked up and saw the rich put in their gifts in the offering box, and he saw a poor woman, poor widow, put in two small copper coins, and he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. It is a picture of the pious and the proud. I have worked all my life. I have gained enough to live by. And they begin to parade their offering around offering time. You know, and it says offering time and you got your various different lines and someone stands and they said, I'm giving a thousand dollars a day. I'm giving $10,000 a day. And they want the people to notice how much they're giving out of their abundance. And one poor lady who had nothing but gives two pennies. God looks at her heart and says she's given more than they have given. No matter what we do, it must come from the heart. It must be for the heart and the love and the compassion of God to demonstrate that we are reflecting him, to demonstrate that we belong to him, to demonstrate the very compassion of God. So as long as God shows us someone in need, we are always making an effort to meet those needs. We cannot be concerned or, or terrified that if we, help, if we start helping people, what are we going to have? Trust in God, listen to God's word, obey God's word. It is in obedience and it is in love that God will continue to pour into this local ministry. The more we continue to give out of obedience to God, the more God will pour back into this ministry. Because at that point, it becomes obvious and, and it becomes very obvious that God can trust us. God can trust us with much because we won't try to hold it all for ourselves, but we will try to make a difference in the very community that God has planted this local body. For the glory of God, you can make a difference. Uh, and let me end with, with this. I was at a uh, pastor's conference today, and, and it was talking about the, the issues that are in our society. And it was a group of white pastors and a group of black pastors uh, trying to come together in a world right now when we are completely divided. Even in the church, if we can be honest and we can state the obvious, even the churches today are divided, uh, the left and the right. Uh, it is hard for anybody who is not black to put on the pair of shoes of a black man or a woman and walk in them 
and not feel that we are not part of this country willingly. We're not part of the justice system. We're not part of this. And unless you put on those shoes, which is an impossible thing to do, but to have the courtesy, but to have the, the compassion to say, I can't put on your shoes, but because you hurt, I hurt. Uh, because you don't feel equal, I don't feel it. And then we come together as, as a body, then we come together as a body. And we try to take the church's stance based off of what God's word says. And then we become the leaders in the community. But we cannot become the leaders in the community if we are still divided as the body of Christ. We cannot be the white church against the black church. It has to be the body of Christ. Once the body of Christ can come together. And if a white church has a need, then we can meet the needs. If a black church has a need, they can meet the needs. And we begin to unite and be unified under the umbrella of Christianity then we'll be able to say with confidence we are truly one nation under God. But until then, the battle and the struggle is still on. The fight is still on. We still have a mandate. But it, in spite of all of that, we still have an obligation to represent God more than anything else. Again, I've said it. When you march, march as a believer. When you protest, protest as a believer. And when you make a difference in this community, do it as a believer. That it will bring glory and honor to our God. Father, we give you praise today for your word, God. We pray that, God, we pray that you would help us to be all that you have called us to be. God, there are many people that are hurting right now. There are countless thousands that have been impacted uh, financially right now. Many are out of work. Many are uh, eating leftovers more than they can, dear God, and they're trying to stretch it. And God, God, some of those, God, you have made us aware of. And God, I pray that, uh, that we would take a rightful stand as a church, as a body to make sure that we make a difference in some lives of those that are struggling, especially those believers that are holding true to the faith and they know that we can make a difference, that we will bless them. And in blessing them, God, will bring your name glory. And as bringing your name glory, God, you continue to lift up and to bless this local body called Living Stone. God, we give you praise. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.